Section 52 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Section 52. Lord Ellingham in the Dungeon four weeks had elapsed since the arrest of tom rain and the extraordinary adventure which had snatched the earl of ellingham from the great world and plunged him into a narrow noisome cell yes four weeks had the nobleman languished in the terrible dungeon ignorant of where his prison-house was situated why his freedom was thus outraged and who were his persecutors every morning at eight o'clock a small trap in the door of his cell was opened and food was passed through to him a lamp had been given him the day after he became an inmate of the place and oil was regularly supplied for the maintenance of the light his food was good and wine accompanied it it was therefore evident that no petty spite nor mean malignity had led to his captivity indeed the man who brought him his food assured him that no harm would befall him that his imprisonment was necessary to suit certain weighty and important interests but that it would not be protracted beyond a few weeks and that the only reason for placing him in such a dungeon was because it was requisite to guard against the possibility of an escape often and often had lord ellingham endeavoured to render his jailer more communicative but the man was not to be coaxed into garrulity neither did he ever allow the nobleman to catch a glimpse of his features when he brought the food to the trap-door he invariably stood on one side and spoke in a feigned tone when replying to any question to which he did vouchsafe an answer the day after his strange and mysterious arrest arthur received from this man the assurances above mentioned and a considerable weight was thereby removed from his mind his imprisonment was not to be eternal a few weeks would see the term of the necessity that had caused it but still he grieved nay felt shocked to think of the state of suspense in which those who cared for him would remain during his long absence the source of affliction he mentioned to the man who attended upon him and the reply was to some extent satisfactory i will supply you with writing materials and you can address letters to your friends stating that sudden business has called you abroad to france for instance and that you may probably be absent six weeks write in this manner the excuse will at least allay any serious fears that may be entertained concerning you and those letters shall be sent through the post to the person to whom they are addressed but you must deliver them unsealed into my hands that i may satisfy myself as to the real nature of their contents small as the satisfaction resulting from this proceeding could be to lord ellingham it was still far preferable to the maintenance of rigid silence in respect to his friends he accordingly wrote a laconic letter in the sense suggested by his jailer and addressed copies to lady hatfield thomas rainford and mr de medina the next time his jailer visited him or rather came to the door of the dungeon the prisoner was informed that the three letters had been duly forwarded through the tuppany post the reader will scarcely require to be informed of the mental anxiety which the nobleman suffered during his incarceration this was naturally great very great he was also frequently plunged into the most bewildering conjectures relative to the authors the motives and the locality of his imprisonment nor less did he grieve oh deeply grieve when he thought of the surprise the alarm and the sorrow with which lady hatfield on one side and rainford on the other must view his mysterious absence 
he had left the former with the intention of seeing the latter and she would naturally expect him to return if for no other reason than to give her an account of their interview and he had quitted rainford with the promise to perform a certain task and also having pledged himself to use his influence and his wealth on his behalf the idea of the feelings that must be entertained by rainford relative to his absence afflicted him more than any other that generous-hearted man had told him to keep his coronet and his fortune to the prejudice of him the elder brother legitimately born and yet that interview in horsemonger lane jail seemed destined to be the last which they were to have together what would the poor prisoner think when the earl returned not and when a letter containing a cold and wretched excuse was put into his hands oh this was the maddening maddening thought and the earl shrank from it far more appalled than from the stern reality of his dungeon because rainford might be judged and alas the law might take its course its fatal course ere he the earl could stretch out a hand to save that generous-hearted half-brother but amidst all the bitter and bewildering reflections which tormented him during his imprisonment of four weeks in that dungeon of unknown neighbourhood there was still a predominant idea a gleam of hope which apart from the assurance that his captivity would soon have a term cheered and animated him often for whither will not the rays of hope penetrate even when hope is really gone her work is often done by despair and the latter feeling in its extreme is thus often akin to hope itself the hope then that cheered and animated the earl at times was escape yes he yearned to quit that dungeon not so much for his own sake oh not nearly so much as for that of his half-brother who was involved in such peril and who needed influence and interest to save him for the earl well knew that the law in criminal cases is not so tardy as in civil matters and that to take away a man's life all its machinery is set in rapid motion although to settle his claims to a fortune or to give him justice against his neighbour it is heaven knows heartbreakingly slow and wearisome to send a man to the scaffold takes but a few weeks at the old bailey to decide the right of this man or that man to a particular estate or legacy occupies years and years in the court of chancery oh how thirsty do our legislators appear to drink human blood how rapidly all technicalities and causes of delay are cleared away when the capital offender stands before his judge a day perhaps an hour is sufficient to decide the death of a human being but half a century may elapse ere the conflicting claims to an acre of land or a few thousand pounds can be settled elsewhere and strange ah and monstrous too is it that the man who loses a case in which he sues his neighbour for twenty pounds may appeal to another tribunal have a new trial granted and losing that also perhaps obtain a third investigation of the point at issue and thus three verdicts in that beggarly business but the man who is doomed to die who loses his case against the criminal prosecutor cannot appeal to another tribunal no judges sit solemnly in banco for him one verdict is sufficient to take away a life away with him to the scaffold in this great commercial country twenty pounds consisting of pieces of paper printed upon and stamped with particular figures are of more consequence than a being of flesh and blood what though this being of flesh and blood may have others a wife and children dependent on him no matter give him not a chance of a new trial let one judge and one jury 
suffice to consign him to the hangman there can be no appeal no reinvestigation for this case although it be a case of life and death but away with him to the scaffold what bloodthirsty and atrocious monsters have our lawgivers been what cruel inhuman beings are they still to perpetrate so abominable so flagrant so infamous a state of jurisprudence for how many have been hanged though innocent their guiltlessness transpiring when it is too late but there is no court of appeal for the man accused of a capital crime he is a dog who has got a bad name and public opinion dooms him to be hanged days and weeks before the jury is sworn or the judge takes his seat to try him and wherefore is not this infamous state of the law which allows appeals to the case of money claims but none to the case of capital accusations wherefore is not this state of the law altered because our legislators are too much occupied with their own party contentions and strifes because they are ever engaged in battling for the ministerial benches the loaves and fishes of power because it seems to them of more consequence to decide whether sir robert peel or lord john russell shall be prime minister whether the conservatives or the whigs shall hold the reins of power or else gentle reader the condition of greece or spain or turkey or even perhaps of otaheite is a matter of far greater importance than the lives of a few miserable wretches in the condemned cells of criminal jails but in our estimation and we have the misfortune to differ from the legislators of the country the life of one of those wretches is a far greater consequence than the state of tyrant-ridden greece the spanish marriages the quarrels of the sultan and his pashas or the miserable squabbles of hypocritical english missionaries and a french governor in tahiti yes in our estimation the life of one man outweighs all such considerations and we would rather see half a session of parliament devoted to the discussion of the grand question of the punishment of death than one single day of that session given to all the foreign affairs that ever agitated in a minister's brain it was the twenty-eighth day of lord ellingham's imprisonment and it was about six o'clock on the evening of this day the nobleman was at work upon the masonry of his dungeon his efforts being directed to remove the stones from the immediate vicinity of a small square aperture or sink in the corner of the cell his implements were a knife and fork and one of the screws of the framework of his bed but with these he worked arduously nor was this the first day of his labors no for twenty-six days had he been toiling 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 on to make an opening into what he believed to be the common sewer even at the risk of inundating his dungeon and thus perishing miserably but all those toils and all that risk were sustained and encountered for thee tom rain slowly 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 had the work progressed but now on the twenty-eighth day arthur found himself so far advanced that escape from the dungeon was at least open to him but escape into what region into those drains and sewers which run beneath the streets of london and form a maze to which the only clue is a knowledge of the point whence he who enters the labyrinth originally starts and this clue was not possessed by arthur for in what part of london his dungeon was situate he had not the least idea it could hardly be said that he was confident of his dungeon being in the metropolis at all and yet he had many reasons to believe that it was for in the first place his jailer had mentioned the fact of his letters having been sent by the twopenny post 
secondly he had ascertained that his cell was situate in the very vicinity of a common sewer and sewers were not at that time formed in the villages surrounding the metropolis and thirdly he could scarcely believe that those who had arrested him in london would have run the risk of removing him out of its precincts for he was well aware that atrocious outages and diabolical crimes may be perpetrated with greater chances of impunity in the metropolis than elsewhere but although he was thus tolerably well convinced that his prison-house was within the boundaries of london he had not the least notion of the precise locality and when he had removed sufficient of the massive masonry to form an aperture large enough to permit a full-grown man to pass into the sewer and when he heard the muddy slimy waters gurgling languidly in the depths below he shuddered and his blood ran cold for he thought within himself i have heard of men who venture into these places in search of treasures and who having wandered for miles and miles beneath the streets of london have issued safely forth again but they knew whence they started and thus that starting point was a clue to guide them in the maze but i know not whether on entering that slimy shallow i should turn to the right or to the left nor which channels to pursue in that terrible labyrinth then ashamed of his fears reproaching himself for his hesitation he drank a deep draught of the wine that had been supplied him in the morning and holding the lamp in one hand and in the other a stout stick cut from one of the cross beams that supported the mattress of his bed he entered the common sewer his feet sank down into the thick slime and the muddy water reached to his knees there was a nauseous odour in the dreary passage and the filthy fluid was very thick these circumstances convinced him that it was low water in the river thames and by examining the masonry forming the sides of the sewers he saw that the tide was running out he therefore resolved to follow the course of the muddy stream with the hope that he might at length reach one of the mouths by which the sewers discharge their contents into the river armed with his stick to protect himself against the rats as well as to sound his way so as to escape any hole or abrupt depth that there might chance to be in the bottom of the sewer and holding the lamp in his left hand the great peer of england pursued his appalling path in a channel seven feet wide and beneath a vaulting twelve feet high from time to time the sudden rush of a number of vermin along the ledge by the side of the channel and then the sound of their plunge into the slimy water startled him to such a degree that he almost dropped his lamp and then the conviction which flashed to his mind that if he lost his light he should be inevitably devoured by those vermin caused such a chill to pass through him as if ice were unexpectedly placed upon his heart that his courage was oftentimes nearly subdued altogether but he thought of his half-brother who had manifested so much generosity towards him he thought of her whom he had promised to love as a sister and he also remembered that were he to retrace his steps even if he could find the way back he should be returning to a dungeon of all this he thought and he went on on in that revolting and perilous maze yes with lamp held high up and stick groping in the filthy mud stirring up nauseating odors on on went the daring enterprising chivalrous nobleman breathing an infected and almost stifling air an air formed of such noxious gases that it might explode at any moment ignited by the lamp but hark what is that rumbling sound like thunder at a vast distance arthur pauses and listens 
the truth in a few moments flashed to his mind he was beneath a street in which vehicles were moving oh now he felt convinced even if he had entertained any doubts before that he was in london watching the progress of the slimy stream he turned first to the left up a channel that branched off from the one which he had originally entered then he turned to the right into another the hollow rumbling sounds overhead gradually increasing in volume and power suddenly he beholds a light glancing upon the putrescent surface of the slimy stream through which he is wading knee-deep that light is half a dozen yards in front of him flickering playfully he advances sounds of footsteps human footsteps come down from overhead he looks up and behold there is a grating in the street above and through that grating the light of the lamp streams and the sound of the footsteps comes he hears voices too as the people pass the voices of that world from all communication with which he is for the time cut off shall he cry out for assistance no a sense of shame prevents him he would not like to be dragged forth from those filthy depths in the presence of a curious gaping staring crowd he prefers the uncertainty and the peril of his subterranean path in the fond hope that it may speedily lead to some safe issue the earl accordingly passed on disturbing the water on which the light from the street lamp played disturbing too the vermin on either side with the splash of the fetid fluid as he waded through it but when he had proceeded a dozen yards he looked back as if unwilling to quit the vicinity of that grating which opened into the street in another moment however he conquered his hesitation and pursued his way in a straight line without again turning off either to the right or to the left upwards of an hour had elapsed since he had quitted the dungeon and as yet he had found no issue from the labyrinth of subterranean passages grim terrors already began to assume palpable forms to his imagination when suddenly he beheld a dim twinkling light like a faint star at a great distance ahead that light seemed a beacon of hope and as he drew nearer and nearer its power increased at last he saw another twinkling light struggling as it were betwixt glimmer and gloom and then a third and then a fourth the air appeared to grow fresher too and the earl at length believed that an opening from the maze must be near yes he was not mistaken the lights increased in number and intensity and he was soon convinced that they shone upon the opposite bank of the thames a few minutes more and all doubt was past the fresh breeze from the river fanned his cheek and as he reached the mouth of the sewer and hurled away his lamp he saw the mighty flood stretched out before him a bridge spanning its width at a little distance on his left hand he knew the bridge he recognized it by the pale lustre of the moon for the evening was clear and fine it was blackfriars bridge then from which direction had he come remembering the turnings he had taken he could fix upon the district of clerkenwell as the scene of his late imprisonment but he did not pause to reflect on a matter now so trivial trivial because he had escaped and was once more free it was low water and a bed of mud received him knee-deep as he leapt from the mouth of the sewer but what cared he for his uncouth and filthy appearance since he had escaped and was once more free for four weeks his beard had not been shaved nor his toilet carefully performed 
and his hair too was long and matted it was therefore necessary to cleanse himself and change his attire as soon as possible hastening along the muddy margin of the river's bed he ascended the steps of a wharf and plunged into the district of whitefriars there selecting the humblest looking public house he could find he entered and as he had his purse about him for those who had imprisoned did not rob him he was enabled to command the necessaries and attentions which he required indeed the landlord willingly supplied a complete change of linen and a suit of his own clothes to a guest who spared not his gold and as mine host and the earl happened to be of the same height and equally slender in figure the garments of the former suited well enough the temporary need of the latter a hundred times while performing his hasty toilet was the earl on the point of summoning the landlord and making inquiries concerning tom rain but the extraordinary appearance which he himself had worn on entering the public-house must he felt convinced have already engendered strange suspicions concerning him and prudence suggested to him the necessity of avoiding any conversations which might strengthen these suspicions and thereby lead him into some embarrassment from which the revelation of his name and rank might alone extricate him but oh how painful how acutely painful was the suspense which he endured while passing through the details of ablution and change of attire and although never were the duties of the toilet more necessary yet never had the earl hurried them over with such feverish excitement at length as st paul's cathedral proclaimed the hour of eight on that eventful evening arthur sallied forth from the public-house leaving the landlord and landlady a prey to the wildest and most unsatisfactory conjectures as to what he was and how he had happened to be in the condition in which he at first presented himself at their establishment they however both agreed that it was a very good evening's work for them inasmuch as their strange guest had paid them with a liberality which would have rendered a similar visit every night of their lives a most welcome godsend in the meantime the earl of ellingham had gained fleet street with the intention of entering some tavern or hotel where a file of newspapers was kept but he was struck by the deserted appearance of the great thoroughfare for the shops were all shut and the vehicles instead of pouring in two dense streams running different ways were few and far between it then struck him that it was sunday evening for though in his dungeon he had been enabled to count the lapse of each day through the date afforded by the morning visits of his jailer yet he had not kept so accurate a calculation as to mark each day by its distinctive name as he stood in fleet street uncertain how to proceed it suddenly struck him that he would purchase a newspaper the office of the weekly dispatch was facing him he entered and bought that day's number such was his intense curiosity nay more his acute and agonizing suspense and so awful were the misgivings which crowded upon his soul that he lingered in the office to glance over the newspaper and my god how he started how his brain reeled how crushed and overwhelmed did he feel when his eyes encountered the dreadful words at the head of the column the convict rainford he staggered against the wainscot of the office and the journal nearly dropped from his hands he endeavoured to master his emotions and refer to the fatal column for further particulars but his brain swam his eyes were dim his glances could not settle themselves upon the point which he vainly endeavoured to make the focus of his attention the clerk in the office fancied that he was suddenly attacked with indisposition and made a polite inquiry to that effect but the earl without giving a direct reply put hasty and impatient questions to him and though his ideas were strangely confused he nevertheless understood the appalling announcement that rainford had been condemned to death and that the sentence was to be carried into execution on the following morning at horsemonger lane jail 
the earl threw down the paper and darted from the office recovered from his state of stupefaction but only to become the prey to the most maddening feelings of despair an empty hackney coach was passing at the moment he stopped it and leapt in exclaiming to the driver to horsemonger lane jail the coachman saw that his fare was impatient to reach that place and he whipped his horses into a decent pace over blackfriars bridge down the wide road went the vehicle then it turned to the left at the obelisk and in a short time it stopped in front of the jail the earl sprang forth and was rushing up to the entrance of the governor's house when an ominous hammering noise fell upon his ears he instinctively glanced upwards and there on the top of the jail standing out in bold relief against the moonlit sky were the black spars of the gibbet which the carpenters had already erected for the ensuing morning's work end of chapter fifty two recording by john brandon section fifty three of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section fifty three lord ellingham's exertions not a cry not a word not even a moan betrayed the feelings of the earl of ellingham as this frightful spectacle met his eyes he was paralyzed stunned stupefied despair was in his heart and he could not lower his glances which were fascinated riveted by that awful engine of death on the summit of the jail this state of complete prostration of all the intellectual energies was suddenly interrupted by a gentle pull at his sleeve and turning abruptly round he beheld by the pale light of the moon a young lad of sickly appearance standing at his elbow do you know me what would you with me demanded the earl sharply yes my lord i know you was the answer delivered in a mournful melancholy tone and i also know that good generous man who the lad burst into an agony of tears and pointed wildly towards the gibbet oh you know rainford exclaimed the earl eagerly tell me my boy speak have you seen him lately this day this evening replied jacob smith for it was he and i have taken leave of him for ever he begged me not to visit him to-morrow for ever echoed the earl in a low and hollow voice but he continued again speaking eagerly and rapidly how does he support his doom with the courage such as the world has seldom seen replied jacob and he frequently speaks of you my lord he speaks of me my boy yes my lord he speaks that some tidings some evil reports which you have probably heard have sent you against him for he received a letter from you a day or two after his arrest my god he suspects me of coldness exclaimed the earl in an impassioned tone oh i must see him i must see him this moment and he was rushing toward the governor's door when jacob again caught him by the sleeve saying it is useless my lord you cannot be admitted to-night the keeper of the prison dare not refuse me cried the earl and he hastened to the door would it not be better my lord asked jacob who had followed him to use the valuable time now remaining for the purpose of saving him true exclaimed the earl struck by the observation an interview with him at this moment would effect no good and would only unman me altogether come with me my lad you take an interest in rainford and you shall be the first to learn the result of the application which i will now make in the proper quarter thus speaking arthur hurried back to the hackney coach and as the door closed upon himself and jacob he said to the driver in a firm tone to the home office during the ride the earl put a thousand questions to jacob smith relative to the convict from the answers he received it appeared that rainford was well convinced that neither sir christopher blunt nor mr curtis had directed mr howard to prosecute him for the robbery for which he was doomed to suffer 
indeed they had declared as much when giving their evidence at the police court and at the old bailey neither did he believe that howard had instituted the proceedings through any personal motive of spite but he entertained the conviction that some secret and mysterious springs had been set in motion to destroy him and that howard had been made the instrument of the fatal design it seemed that jacob had visited him as often as the prison regulations would permit and that he had been the bearer of frequent letters between rainford and the beautiful jewess who had removed from brandon street a few days after his arrest this change of residence being effected by the express wishes of tom rain who was afraid lest the malignity of his unknown enemies might extend to herself jacob also casually mentioned that the very first time he had been sent to see the jewess which appeared to have been the morning after lord ellingham's laconic letter was received by rainford she enclosed a number of papers in a packet which she carefully sealed and which jacob conveyed to the prisoner when i was with him this evening added the lad he gave me that packet which he redirected to your lordship and desired me to leave it at your lordship's residence to-morrow when all should be over but since i have thus unexpectedly met you sobs choked the youth's utterance as he passed the sealed packet to the earl who received it in profound silence for well did he divine the nature of its contents and his heart was rent with anguish as he felt all the generosity of that deed on thy part tom rain but in a few moments the spark of hope that already scintillated within him was fanned into a bright and glowing flame for he now possessed proofs to convince the secretary of state that in allowing the law to take its course an individual rightly entitled to an earldom would suffer death and arthur was well aware of the influence which such an argument would have in supporting his appeal for the commutation of the sentence thy generous act in giving up the papers which thou mightest have used to save thy life he thought within himself apostrophizing his doomed half-brother shall not be thrown away on me ingratitude to thee were impossible then turning to jacob he said aloud i am much mistaken my boy if these papers which you have placed in my hands will not affect the great object that we have in view oh my lord exclaimed jacob with the most sincere joyfulness of manner is there really so much hope ah if not for him at least for that poor lady who loves him so deeply has she seen him hastily inquired the earl once once only answered jacob and that was this afternoon i was not present at the farewell scene but i was in the neighborhood when she came out again and i do not wish ever to witness a beautiful woman's grief again my lord i have passed through much seen much and distress and misery in all their worst forms are known to me but as long as i live will the image of that poor creature as the wind blew aside her veil for a few moments oh i cannot bear to think of it he shall be restored to her my lad exclaimed the earl emphatically the more i ponder upon the case the more firmly do i become convinced that it is one in which the home secretary may exercise the prerogative of mercy it is not as if blood had been shed at this moment the hackney coach stopped at the door of the home office and the earl alighted bidding jacob await his return but what language can describe the violence of that sudden revulsion of feeling which arthur experienced when on inquiry he learnt that the home secretary was neither at his official nor his private residence in london as he had set out on the preceding evening for his country seat in the north of england with the rapidity of lightning did the earl calculate the chances of overtaking him by means of fleet horses but a few moments reflection showed him the impossibility of accomplishing 
that undertaking in time to make its result supposing it were successful available to the doomed victim the reprieve might be granted but it would arrive in london too late the earl was well aware that it was useless to seek the prime minister as that functionary would have no alternative save to reply that he could not possibly interfere in a case so essentially regarding the department of the home secretary arthur's mind was accordingly made up in a very few moments he would repair at once to the king who as he learnt at the home office was fortunately for his purpose at buckingham palace it was now ten o'clock at night there were but ten hours before him but in that interval much might be done returning to the coach he desired to be driven to his own house and while proceeding thither he acquainted jacob with the cruel disappointment he had sustained by the absence of the secretary of state and stated his resolution to repair at once to the dwelling of the king thus the poor wretched lad became by his generous sympathy for tom rain the companion and confidant of the great noble great was the joy which prevailed amongst the earl's household when he made his appearance once more at his own abode the servants had indeed heard from dr lascelles as much as the physician himself had learnt through the medium of the vague and laconic letter which the earl was permitted to write to him from his dungeon but still the protracted absence of their master had occasioned them the most lively uneasiness and they were therefore heartily glad to behold his return but he was compelled to cut short the congratulations proffered him and the orders that he issued were given with an unwonted degree of impatience let the carriage be ordered round directly let some one hasten to acquaint lady hatfield with my return and also send up to grafton street to request dr lascelles to come hither as soon as possible and to wait for me never mind how late let this lad be taken care of he added indicating jacob and see that he wants for nothing then hastening upstairs to his own chamber he locked himself in having declined the attendance of his valet he tore open the packet which jacob had given him and beheld a small leathern case this case contained a roll of letters and other documents tied round with a piece of riband so faded that it was impossible to determine what its colour might have originally been there was also accompanying this roll a brief note addressed to himself with trembling hand he opened the note and with beating heart and tearful eyes read the following words i have sent you the papers my dear brother for so i shall make bold to call you still to convince you that i did not forge an idle tale when we met last whatever your motive for abandoning me in my last hours may be i entertain no ill feeling toward you on the contrary i hope that god may prosper you and give you long life to enjoy that title and fortune which in so short a time will be beyond the possibility of dispute i had promised to leave behind me a written narrative of my checkered and eventful history for your perusal but need i explain wherefore i have not fulfilled this promise t r the earl wept oh he wept plenteously as he read those lines he thinks that i have abandoned him and he expresses the most generous wishes for my prosperity he cried aloud oh my god i must save him i must save him he waited not to examine the roll of papers his half-brother intimated that the necessary proofs were there and though no human eye watched the earl's motions at that moment still he would not imply a doubt of rainford's word by examining the documents but he hastened to dress himself in attire suitable to his contemplated visit to the king
and his toilette was completed just as the carriage drove round to the door a few minutes afterwards he was rolling along rapidly in the vehicle towards buckingham palace the papers carefully secured about his person and his heart palpitating violently with the cruel suspense of mingled hope and fear alas he was doomed to another disappointment though it was but little past eleven o'clock king george the fourth had already retired to rest or rather had been borne away in a senseless state from one of those beastly orgies in which the filthy voluptuary so often indulged this much was intimated to the earl by a nobleman attached to the royal person and with whom arthur was well acquainted quitting the palace in disgust combined with despair lord ellingham returned home but no we were wrong he did not entirely despair one hope of saving rainford's life one faint hope remained a hope so wild so extravagant and involving a chance with some fearful odds against it that it could only have been conceived by one who was determined to leave no means however difficult unadopted in order to attain a particular end on crossing the threshold of his door arthur's first inquiry was whether dr lascelles had arrived the reply was an affirmative and the earl hastened to the apartment to which the physician had been shown it is not however necessary to relate the particulars of their interview inasmuch as the nature of the conversation which passed between them will be developed hereafter end of section fifty three recording by john brandon section fifty four of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section fifty four the fatal monday morning broke yellow heavily and gloomily and the light stole or rather struggled by degrees into the convict's cell shortly before seven o'clock tom rain awoke and casting his eyes rapidly around they successively fell upon the turnkey who had sat up with him the still flickering lamp upon the common deal table the damp stone walls and the massive bars at the windows for an instant a cold shudder convulsed his frame as the conviction the appalling truth burst upon him that the horrors of his dreams were not to cease with the slumber that had given them birth but with knitting brow and compressed lip like a strong-minded man who endeavors to conceal the pain inflicted on him by a surgical operation of a dreadful nature he struggled with his emotions and when the governor and clergyman entered the dungeon they found him firm and resolute though not insolent nor reckless the chaplain offered to pray with him and he consented to join in devotion there was profound sincerity but no affectation no hypocrisy no passionate exclamation in the prayer which tom rain uttered extemporaneously as the clock chimed half past seven he arose from his knees saying i am now prepared to die but there was yet another half hour before him scarcely had the clock finished chiming when the door was opened and the earl of ellingham entered the cell heedless of the impression which his conduct might produce upon the prison authorities present arthur rushed forward and threw himself into rainford's arms exclaiming no i had not wilfully abandoned you thomas just now i said that i was prepared to die answered the convict returning the embrace with congenial warmth 
and now i may even add that i shall die contented the time is too precious to waste in mere details returned arthur or i would tell you how i have been kept away from you by force by a vile outrage but you do not now believe that i was willingly absent that i wantonly neglected you no no exclaimed rainford i seek not an explanation i require none it is enough that you are here now at the last hour the earl then related in a few hurried words the vain exertions he had made on the preceding evening on behalf of rainford who expressed his lively gratitude arthur next requested the governor to permit him to have a few minutes private conversation with the prisoner but this favour could not be granted and the earl dared not persist in his demand as the chaplain hinted that the convict had bidden adieu to the affairs of this life and had but little time left for devotion thus was it that arthur and rainford had no opportunity of speaking together in private although the former had something important to communicate and the latter perceived that such was the fact arthur said tom approaching close to his half-brother and speaking in a low solemn tone is there any hope none on this side of the scaffold returned the earl with a significant glance as he dwelt on his words and as he spoke he took the prisoner's hand as if to wring it fervently but rainford felt something in the earl's palm and instantly comprehended that it was an object which he was to take unnoticed by the jail authorities then rapid as the lightning flash he perceived a double meaning in the words on this side of the scaffold because he knew that arthur would not use those awful words the scaffold but would have said the tomb had he not had some special profound motive and rainford did comprehend the hint the hope conveyed and though he thanked his half-brother with a rapid expressive glance yet a sickly smile played upon his lip indicative of the faintness of that hope so created at the same instant heavy footsteps were heard approaching the cell and the chaplain said in a solemn tone the hour is almost come then arthur once more threw himself into the prisoner's arms and whispered rapidly in his ear keep the tube in your throat and you will be saved rainford murmured an assent and the brothers embraced with a fervour which astonished those present to whom their relationship was totally unknown arthur then tore himself from the cell not for worlds could he behold that horrible process termed the toilet he had also another motive for quitting the dungeon before the last moment this was to meet the sheriff of the county in the passage and behold in the corridor he encountered that functionary the javelin men and the under sheriff behind whom came the executioner and his assistant the earl accosted the sheriff with whom he was acquainted and who was naturally surprised to meet the nobleman there drawing him aside arthur said in a hasty tone i have a favour a great favour to ask of you the convict is well connected and his friends demand the body to bury it decently the earnest prayer that i have to offer you on their behalf is that you will not prolong the feelings of shame and ignominy which they will experience during the time the corpse remains suspended my lord replied the sheriff the body shall be cut down at twenty minutes past eight and delivered over to the unhappy man's friends a thousand thanks said the earl pressing the sheriff's hand he then hurried away and the procession moved on to the cell <laughs> 
immense was the crowd gathered around the jail to witness the execution of the celebrated highwayman who had been proved on his trial to be none other than the notorious black mask who some years previously had performed the most extraordinary deeds of daring and audacity in the county of hants yes immense was the crowd and not only did the living ocean inundate all the open spaces about the jail and all the thoroughfares leading thither but it seemed to force its offshooting streams and channels up the very walls of the surrounding dwellings so densely filled with faces were the open windows even to the housetops near the front gate of the jail stood a black coach and a hearse and concealed between the vehicles and the prison wall were the earl of ellingham dr lasalle's and three of the nobleman's own men servants all muffled in black mourning cloaks and holding white handkerchiefs to their faces so as to hide their features as much as possible lord ellingham was convulsed with grief far far more than the convict himself did the generous-hearted nobleman suffer on this terrible morning he was benumbed with cold his body felt like a dead weight which his legs could scarcely sustain his tongue clave to the roof of his mouth a suffocating sensation oppressed him and he felt as if all the most frightful misfortunes had suddenly combined to fall with crushing burden on his own head the clock of st george's in the borough began to strike eight the clock of the prison echoed those iron notes which sent upon the wing of the air the signal for death suddenly the hum of the multitudes ceased and an awful silence prevailed the earl and the physician knew by those signs that the convict had just appeared on the roof of the jail but from where they were stationed they could not command a view of the dreadful scene above and even if they had been differently placed lord ellingham at least would not have raised his eyes towards the fatal tree and now amidst that solemn silence a voice was heard the solemn deep-toned monotonous voice of the chaplain saying i am the resurrection and the life saith the lord he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god the voice ceased a sudden sensation ran through the crowd like an electric shock and the earl of ellingham groaned deeply groaned in the bitterness of his spirit for he knew that the drop had just fallen compose yourself my dear friend whispered the physician for now is the time to arm yourself with all your energies thanks doctor a thousand thanks for reminding me of my duty said the earl but this is most trying most horribly trying i have lived a hundred years of agony in the last few minutes hope for the best my dear earl rejoined the physician do you think that he fully understood you he did i am convinced of it replied arthur anxious to argue himself out of all doubts as well as to convince his companion he received the silver tube and i saw him conceal it in his sleeve but alas we had no opportunity to speak alone though i had so much to say to him so many explanations to give such numerous questions to ask my god if if after all this plan should fail if that boy jacob will only follow my instructions to the very letter answered lascelles i do not despair of success oh he will he will returned the young nobleman as he glanced towards the hearse he is as intelligent as he is attached to my dear brother the railings in front of the jail kept the crowd at a considerable distance from the mourning vehicles and thus the observations 
which passed between the earl and the physician were not heard by any save themselves and now how languidly how slowly passed the interval of twenty minutes during which the sheriff had stated that the body must remain suspended to the earl it seemed as if each minute were a year as if he were living twenty years in those twenty minutes and the crowds had broken the silence which had fallen upon them like a spell and ribald jests obscene remarks terrible execrations and vile practical jokes now proclaimed how efficacious is the example of public strangulation at last the public clock chimed the quarter past eight and more acute more agonizing grew the suspense of the earl of ellingham a thousand fears assailed him rainford might not have been able to use the silver tube or its imagined effect might have failed or the knot of the rope might have broken his neck again the sheriff might forget his promise and allow the convict to hang an hour according to the usual custom and even if all these fears were without foundation the physician might not be able to fulfil his expectations cruel cruel was the suspense appalling were the apprehensions endured by the young nobleman he looked at his watch it was seventeen minutes and a half past eight two minutes and a half more if the sheriff had not forgotten his promise but no he was even better than his word for scarcely had arthur returned the watch to his pocket when the sudden sensation again pervaded the multitude and several voices cried they're going to cut him down then came a dead silence an intense heat ran like molten lead through the earl's veins and at the next moment he turned death-like cold as if plunged into an ice bath if he had hitherto lived years in minutes he now seemed to exist whole centuries in moments all the fears which had previously struck him one by one now rushed in an aggregate crowd to his soul the next two minutes were all of fury and horror fury in his brain horror in his heart but at last the gate of the jail opened and a gruff voice exclaimed now then the earl's three men servants hastened to range themselves near the door of the hearse which one of them opened and when the jail officials appeared bearing the coffin these servants advanced a few paces to relieve them of their burden and thrust it into the hearse while dr lascelles diverted the attention of the officials by distributing money amongst them this proceeding which had been prearranged by the earl and the physician with the three servants was absolutely necessary because jacob smith was concealed within the hearse the affair having proceeded successfully thus far the hearse moved away and the five persons who acted as mourners entered the black coach which also drove off for the sake of appearances it was necessary that the vehicles should move slowly along until the outskirts of the multitude were entirely passed and then when blackman street was reached the hearse and the black coach were driven along at a rate which is adopted by funeral processions only when the obsequies are over end of section fifty four recording by john brandon section fifty five of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rod. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Galvanism. By the time St. George's Church was passed, the drivers had whipped their horses into a furious gallop.
and on, on went the morning vehicles like the wind. The sleek and pampered black horses panted and foamed, but the coachman cared not. They were well paid for what they were doing. Down Union Street rolled the chariot and the hearse, into the Blackfriars Road, up the wide thoroughfare to the river, over the bridge, along Farringdon Street, and through Smithfield to Clerkenwell Green. In an incredibly short space of time, the two vehicles stopped at the door of a house in Red Lion Street. Dr. Lascelles was the first to leap from the morning coach, and taking a key from his pocket, he opened the door of the house, into which, quickly as active men could move or work, the coffin was borne from the hearse. Jacob Smith was helped out immediately afterwards, and he followed the earl, the physician, and the three servants into the house, while the morning coach and the hearse still waited at the door. A quarter of an hour afterwards the coffin, with the lid now screwed down, was borne back to the hearse. The three servants returned to the morning coach, and the funeral procession was set in motion again, but with slow and suitable solemnity. In another half hour the coffin, with the name of Thomas Rainford upon the plate, was interred in St Luke's churchyard, and thus ended this ceremony. But did that coffin really contain the cold corpse of the once gallant highwayman? No, it had been hastily filled with stones and straw at the house in Red Lion Street. And the body? The moment the coffin was borne into the house in Red Lion Street in the manner already described, Jacob Smith closed the door behind him and exclaimed in a triumphant tone as he produced the silver tube from his pocket, It was in his throat! I took it out, and I rubbed his temples with hartshorn and applied it to his nostrils the whole way from the jail to this place. Oh, he will be saved! He will be saved! The lid of the coffin, which had not been screwed down, was removed and in the shell lay the highwayman with eyes closed and pale as death. The Earl of Ellingham shuddered convulsively and uttered a groan of anguish, but Dr. Lascelles gave his instructions with so much presence of mind and yet such rapidity that the intensity of the nobleman's grief was soon partially absorbed in the excitement of the scene that now followed. The body was removed as hastily as possible upstairs and carried into a spacious laboratory where it was immediately stretched upon the table. The three servants then retraced their way downstairs, filled the coffin with stones and straw, screwed the lid tight, and departed with it, as already stated, to St Luke's churchyard. In the meantime, the physician, the earl, and Jacob Smith remained in the laboratory, and now was the profound scientific knowledge of Dr Lascelles about to be applied to the most wonderful act of human aims, the resuscitation of a convict who had been hanged. The poles of a powerful galvanic pile were applied to the body, from which the animal heat had not altogether departed when it was taken from the coffin, and the force of the electric fluid almost immediately displayed its wondrous influence. An universal tremor passed over the frame of Rainford, and ejaculations of ineffable joy burst from the lips of Lord Ellingham and Jacob Smith. Dr. Lascelles continued to let fall upon the body a full quantum of the electric fluid, and in less than a minute the right arm of the highwayman moved, moved with a kind of spasmodic quivering. Then, in a few seconds, it was suddenly raised with eagerness and impatience, and the hands sought the throat. With convulsive motion that hand kept grasping the throat as if to tear away something that oppressed it, as if the horrible rope still encircled it. Then Rainford's chest began to swell and work with the violence of returning respiration, as if a mighty current of air were rushing back to the lungs. "'He breathes! He breathes!' cried Ellingham and Jacob Smith, as it were in one voice. "'He will be saved!' said the physician calmly, as he again applied the poles of the battery, provided congestion of the brain does not take place, for that is to be dreaded. But the nobleman and the poor lad heard not this alternative of sinister and dubious import. They had no ears for anything save those blessed words, He will be saved. And they were literally wild with joy. Lascelles, without desisting from his occupation of applying the electric fluid, and apparently without noticing the excitement, the delirium of happiness and hope which had seized upon his two companions, began leisurely to explain how it was necessary to adopt means to equalise the reviving circulation, 
and though he called for hartshorn, he was not heard. At length he stamped his foot violently on the floor, exclaiming, "'Will neither of you give me the hartshorn? Do you wish him to die through your neglect?' The earl instantly checked the exuberance of his joyous emotions, and hastened to obey all the instructions which the physician gave him. The hartshorn was applied to Rainsford's nostrils, and in a few moments his lips began to quiver. Then, on a sudden, as Lascelles let fall upon him a stronger current of the electric fluid, a terrific cry burst from the object of all this intensely concentrated interest. But never was cry of human agony more welcome to mortal ears than now, for it told those who heard it that life was in him who gave vent to it. The physician felt the highwayman's pulse. It beat feebly, very feebly, but still it beat. And now his limbs moved with incessant trembling, and he waved his right hand backwards and forwards, his breast heaving with repeated sighs and gasps and painful moans. The doctor applied a small mirror to Rainsford's mouth and nostrils, and it was instantly covered with a cloud. He now opened his eyes slowly. They were much bloodshot but the pupils indicated the reviving fires of vitality. His breathing rapidly grew more regular, and though he retained his eyes open, yet he seemed unconscious of all that was passing around him, and gazed upwards with the most death-like indifference. Lord Ellingham cast a glance of frightful apprehension towards the physician, but the countenance of Dr. Lascelles wore an expression of calm and complacent satisfaction, and the Earl was reassured. Twenty minutes had now passed since the galvanic operation had commenced, and at last Dr. Lascelles said emphatically, He is saved. The Earl embraced him as if he were a father who had just manifested some extraordinary proof of paternal love, or who had forgiven some deep offence on the part of a son. We must put him to bed immediately, said the physician, with difficulty extricating himself from the nobleman's embrace, and fearing, lest he should be compelled to undergo a similarly affectionate process at the hands of Jacob Smith, who was equally enthusiastic in his joy. We must put him to bed immediately, repeated Dr. Lascelles, and fortunately for us there is a bedchamber in the house. The three then carefully lifted Tom Rain into a small room furnished as a bedchamber, and where they undressed him and deposited him in the bed. "'And now,' said Jacob Smith, "'we should remember that there is one who will feel as much joy as ourselves.' "'True,' cried the Earl. "'But where does she live?' "'I am acquainted with her abode,' returned the lad. "'If your lordship will allow me—' "'Yes, my good boy,' interrupted Arthur. "'It is for you to convey these joyous tidings. "'But perhaps she may have returned home to her father, "'for after all that has occurred, "'and considering Mr. de Medina's affection for his daughter—' But all this while we are talking enigmatically in the presence of my excellent friend the doctor, from whom there must be no secrets. Never mind me, said Lascelles laconically, who perfectly well comprehended the nature of their illusions. I care little for your secrets, and, even if it were otherwise, I am too much occupied with my patient here. Then we will not trouble you with explanations at present, interrupted the old Jacob, my lad, hasten to the lady of whom we speak, break the happy tidings to her gently, and bring her hither. "'Yes, my lord,' answered the lad, delighted at being chosen as the messenger of good tidings in such a case. "'Fortunately, Mr. Medina moved from Brandon Street into the heart of the city, by Mr. Rainford's positive directions, and I shall not be long before I come back with her.' The Earl put gold into his hand, but Jacob returned it, declaring that he was not without money, and in another minute the front door of the house closed behind him. End of section 55. Recording by Rod. Section 56 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rod. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds, Section 56 Chapter 55 The Laboratory, Esther de Medina When Jacob had taken his departure, Dr. Lascelles returned to his laboratory, mixed some liquid ingredients in a glass, and returning to the bedchamber, 
poured the medicine down Rainford's throat. He then felt his pulse, applied his ear to his chest to listen to the pulsation of his heart, and carefully examined his eyes, which were far less bloodshot than when they opened first. "'He is getting on admirably,' said the physician. "'His pulsation is regular, and neither too quick nor too slow, but just as I could wish it. He seems inclined to sleep. Yes, he closes his eyes, and he will awake to perfect consciousness. But do you know, my dear friend, that in order to oblige you I have incurred an awful risk?' continued the doctor. The law would not believe me, were I to declare that it was in the interest of science I made these galvanic experiments, and that having succeeded in recalling the man to life, I was not capable of delivering him up to justice. Let us hope that there will be no necessity to make such an excuse at all, said the earl. You have rendered me an immense service, doctor. Then I am satisfied, interrupted Lascelles, for after all you told me last night, I cannot help liking your half-brother here. He is a generous-hearted fellow, and one would risk much to save such a man from death. You had frequently mentioned to me in your galvanic experiments, said the earl, and last night, when nearly driven to desperation by the absence of the Home Secretary, the reminiscence of all the wonders you had at different times related to me in respect to galvanism flashed to my mind, and I sent for you as a drowning man clings to a straw. In the adjoining room, observed the physician, I have tried the influence of galvanism upon thousands of animals and on several men. I have paid high prices to obtain the bodies of convicts as soon as they were cut down, but never until this day did I succeed in restoring the vital spark. Neither would this experiment have been successful had we not adopted all the precautions I suggested. The tube in the throat to allow respiration, and Jacob Smith in the hearse to remove the suffocating nightcap from Rainford's head, and the tube from his throat, and then to apply the heart's horn to his nostrils and his temples. Step with me again into the laboratory. You have not yet had time to examine its curiosities, added the physician with a smile. Rainford sleeps, he continued, glancing towards the bed, and we shall have a little leisure to inspect the laboratory. They accordingly proceeded into the adjacent room, where Lascelles directed his companion's attention to the various galvanic and electrical apparatus. "'I am also a devoted disciple of Gaul and Spritzheim,' observed the physician, when he had expatiated upon the discoveries of Galvani. Footnote. Mr. Peck, B.A., in his interesting papers on electricity in Reynolds' miscellany, gives the ensuing particulars. The discovery of galvanic electricity was the result of accident. Madame Galvani, the wife of a distinguished Italian philosopher, being recommended by her medical adviser to partake of broth prepared from frogs. Several of these little animals were procured, and were replaced prior to their being cooked in the laboratory of her husband. Some of Monsieur Galvani's friends happened to be amusing themselves with an electrical machine, which was standing in the room, and by chance one of the frogs was touched with a scalpel. To Madame Galvani's surprise she observed the limbs of the frogs exhibit a convulsive motion. Upon examining them closely she perceived that the muscles were affected at the very time when sparks were received from the machine. When her husband returned she acquainted him with the circumstance. For some time previously, M. Galvani had entertained a belief that muscular action was affected by electricity, and had been experimenting for the purpose, if possible, of verifying this hypothesis. Delighted by the discovery, he lost no time in trying a variety of experiments. At first he tested the effect of sparks alone on dissected frogs, gradually varying the intensity of the spark. In every case, however, even when the electric action was feeble, he noticed that the muscles of the frogs gave evidence of susceptibility to its influence. He next made experiments with atmospheric electricity. The same result ensued as when the electric action had been elicited by artificial means. In another paper of the same interesting series, the following account is given. On the evening of January the 28th, during a somewhat extraordinary display of northern lights, a lady became so highly charged with electricity as to give out vivid electrical sparks at the end of each finger to the face of each of the company present. 
This did not cease with the heavily phenomenon, but continued for several months, during which time she was constantly charged, and giving off electrical sparks to every conductor she approached, so that she could not touch the stove, nor any metallic utensils, without first giving off an electrical spark, with the consequent twinge. The state most favourable to this phenomenon was an atmosphere of about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, moderate exercise and social enjoyment. It disappeared in any atmosphere approaching zero, and under the debilitating effects of fear. When seated by the stove, reading, with her feet upon the fender, she gave out sparks at the rate of three or four each minute, and, under the most favourable circumstances, a spark that could be seen, heard, or felt past every second. She could charge others in the same way, when insulated, who could then give sparks to others. To make it satisfactory that her dress did not produce it, it was changed to cotton and woollen, without altering the phenomenon. The lady is about thirty of sedentary pursuits and delicate state of health. We avail ourselves of the digressive facility afforded us by this note to the text to relate a true history of the resuscitation of a man who had been hanged, a history which is perhaps one of the most extraordinary romances of real life upon record. It is as follows. Ambrose Gwinnett was hanged at Deal for the murder of a man who merely disappeared and whose body was not found. Circumstantial evidence certainly pointed strongly to Gwinnett as a murderer, but still it was not proved in the first instance that a murder had been really committed. Gwinnett and another man of the name of Collins arrived together at an inn in Deal. Gwinnett borrowed Collins's clasp knife during supper time in the presence of the waiter. On the following morning Collins was missing and Gwinnett had been met on the stairs in the middle of the night coming up from the garden. Blood was found in the garden and in the midst of the blood was the clasp knife, open. The traces of blood were continued down to the seaside and there they ceased. Gwinnett was moreover found to have in his pocket Collins's purse, which the waiter had seen overnight in Collins's possession. Gwinnett's defence was that he had received the purse after the waiter left the room on the preceding evening in consequence of an arrangement that he, Gwinnett, should be paymaster from them both, that he had gone downstairs in the night for a certain purpose to the garden, that his nose had bled dreadfully, that he had used the clasp knife to raise the latch of the door and had dropped it in the dark, and that he had walked down to the seaside close by to wash his face and hands and stop the bleeding at the nose with the cold salt water. This tale was not believed. Gwinnett was found guilty of murder and hanged on Sandown Common, but a shepherd, passing by the gibbet a few hours after the execution and while the victim was hanging in chains, perceived signs of life in him and cut him down. Gwinnett was recovered, and the kind-hearted shepherd sent him abroad. In a distant colony, Gwinnett met Mr. Collins, the very man for whose alleged murder he had been hanged. An explanation immediately ensued. On the night in question, Collins had also gone downstairs to the garden, and had been carried off by a press gang who passed along the seashore at the time. He was conveyed to a boat, and in that transported to the tender vessel lying in the downs. The vessel sailed next morning, and Collins had heard nothing of the dilemma of his friend until they met as just described. End of footnote. Behold that row of plaster of Paris casts of heads, he continued, pointing to a shelf whereon upwards of fifty of the objects mentioned were ranged. They have afforded me much scope for curious speculation and profound study. "'I observe that you have casts of the heads of several celebrated criminals amongst them,' said the Earl. "'Arthur Thistlewood, Daniel Hoggart, George Barrington, Henry Fauntleroy, John Thurtell, William Probert, and many others, as you perceive, my dear Earl,' interrupted LaSalle. "'The prejudice is as yet so strong amongst people in respect to phrenology and craniology that it is difficult to obtain the casts of living heads. I am therefore forced to make friends with the turnkeys in jails and with the relations of criminals who are hung or who die in prison to get casts. Moreover, the heads of men who have led remarkable lives or who have suffered for their crimes afford such interesting subjects for study and comparison. Comparison between the head of the man and the monkey, said the Earl with a smile. 
decidedly exclaimed the physician but i will not bore you with my theories and speculations on this subject you may however suppose that i am not a little enthusiastic in the matter since i have taken the trouble to have human heads prepared and articulated to facilitate my studies thus speaking he opened the door of a cupboard the earl started back for four human countenances met his astonished and horrified gaze and four pairs of human eyes seemed to glare ominously upon him at the same time his nostrils were assailed with a strong odour of spices you need not be afraid of them ejaculated the physician laughing they will not speak to you but how whence did you obtain i suppose you think i murdered four men for the sake of their heads cried lascelles laughing more heartily still why my dear earl you would be surprised perhaps to learn that i often pass whole nights in this laboratory making galvanic experiments or pursuing my phrenological and craniological researches but these heads were obtained from the hospitals and i myself embalmed and prepared as you now see them i was not aware that you possessed this laboratory observed the earl until you stated the fact last night nor would you ever have known it had it not been for the desire which you expressed that science should exert itself to rescue your half-brother from the grasp of death answered the physician the truth is i have had this laboratory upwards of seventeen or eighteen years i was always devoted to science especially that on which my own profession is based and the spirit of anatomical inquiry made me anxious to obtain as many subjects or in plain terms dead bodies as possible i was therefore thrown into perpetual intercourse with resurrection men who of course are not the best of characters but i was afraid of having corpses brought to my own house in grafton street and i was also desirous to fit up for myself a laboratory in some retired neighbourhood where i could pursue my studies without the least fear of interruption on such occasions when the humour might seize me i hinted as much to one of the rascals who sold me subjects and he put me in communication with a man of the name of tidmarsh after some haggling and hesitation on the part of tidmarsh and when he had consulted or pretended to consult his principal he introduced me to this house and i hired this room at an enormous rental i did not however care about the high rate demanded of me for the use of the place because it is not only in a most retired neighbourhood but there is also a private and subterranean means of egress and ingress from another street which is useful you know for one who has to deal with resurrectionists and are you the only tenant of this house inquired the earl for i presume that the bedchamber in which poor thomas lies is not your own no some old man occasionally visits the house and now and then sleeps in that room returned the physician but i have only seen him once or twice and do not even know his name i have my own key for the front door and i am acquainted with the secret of the subterranean passage but i never hold any communication with tidmarsh before, beyond paying him the rent when it is due and when i happen to meet the old man i have alluded to we merely exchange a word and pass on he has his rooms in the house and i have mine and as he does not interfere with me i never trouble myself about him nor his concerns then for aught you know doctor said the earl you may occupy an apartment in the house of bad characters what do i care exclaimed lascelles i could not well have such a laboratory as this at my own residence my servants would talk about these human heads and those plaster casts and the galvanic experiments and i should be looked upon as a sorcerer or at all events with so much suspicion and aversion as to lose all my practice and by the by my dear earl you should be the very last added the doctor with a smile to hint at the possibility of this house being connected with bad characters for had i not a laboratory in so quiet a street a street too where no questions are ever asked nor observations made your poor brother might have waited long enough for the chance of resuscitation by galvanic means true my dear doctor i was unjust said the earl but you will forgive me say no more about it arthur were men of scientific research to be over particular they might as well abandon their studies at once the experiments i have made on corpses in this room could scarcely have been performed at my own residence and to tell you very candidly i believe that the old man who has the other apartments on this floor is either a miser or a rogue but i care nothing about him or his affairs and now i will mention to you one very extraordinary circumstance it must have been as near as i can guess five weeks ago that i was one night pursuing my galvanic experiments in this room 
I had been operating on diverse rabbits, frogs and rats, and maybe, for anything I recollect, a few cats, when I was compelled to go downstairs for a particular purpose. On my return, as I came back by that door, he continued, pointing to one at the farther end of the room, and which leads to the staircase, I was startled, nay, positively astounded, at seeing a man standing near this cupboard, and gazing fixedly on the human heads. I confess I was alarmed at the moment, because I had heard voices in the house during the half-hour previously, and I remember that I rushed back and instinctively barred and bolted the door. But the man turned round before I had time to close the door, and I caught a glimpse of his face. That man... Now, who do you think he was? It is impossible to guess, Doctor, said the Earl. He was your half-brother, who now lies in the adjoining room, added Lascelles. Thomas, here? cried Arthur, profoundly surprised. I could not possibly make a mistake, because I had seen him before, no matter how or where, and knew him immediately, continued the physician. Well, I must confess that I was uncertain how to act. I did not wish him to recognise me, although perhaps he had already done so, and I could not very well leave the house and return to Grafton Street at once, because I had on a dressing gown, and had left my coat in this room. I was halfway down the stairs leading to the hall, when I heard someone opening the front door with a key. Knowing that it must be either the old man I have before mentioned, or Tidmarsh, as they alone besides myself had keys of the front door, I waited till the person came in, and it was Tidmarsh. I immediately told him what I had seen. Ah, said he, I suspected there was something wrong, and that made me get up, dress, and come round. His words astonished me, and I requested an explanation, but he seemed sorry that he had uttered them inadvertently, and gave some evasive reply. He, however, accompanied me upstairs. We entered the laboratory, and no one was there. We went into the next room, the one where Rainford is now sleeping, and there we found the carpet moved away from the trap-door. "'The trap-door!' exclaimed the Earl. "'Yes, a trap-door that leads to the subterranean passage which I have mentioned to you,' added Lascelles. "'But you must remember that all I have told you about this house is in the strictest confidence. Well, we found the carpet moved away from the trap-door, though the trap itself was closed. Old Tidmarsh instantly fastened the trap with a secret spring.' which there is to it, and spread the carpet over the floor again. "'But does he know the means of getting out at the other end?' I inquired, shocked at the thought of Rainford being immured in the subterranean. "'Do you think he would venture down there if he were not acquainted with the secrets of the place?' demanded Tidmarsh. This struck me as being consistent with common sense, and moreover I began to fancy that Tidmarsh and Rainford must be connected together. "'Pardon me, my dear Earl, for saying so, but that suspicion was encouraged in my mind by the singular and mysteriously significant observation that Tidmarsh had dropped when I met him on the stairs, so I felt no farther uneasiness, but took my departure for Grafton Street. Tidmarsh quitted the house with me and left me at the corner of Turnmill Street close by, as he lives there.' "'Do you know?' said the Earl of Ellingham who now appeared to be occupied with an idea which had just struck him. Do you know that all this conversation about subterraneans and secret passages and trap-doors has created a strange suspicion in my mind? Relative to what? demanded the physician. I briefly explained to you last night the cause of my disappearance for four long weeks, continued the Earl. I also acquainted you with the manner of my escape. Now, I am convinced, by the direction I took, in threading those dreadful sewers, that I was a prisoner somewhere in Clerkenwell, and perhaps, who knows, indeed, it is highly probable, that the very subterranean of which you have spoken may contain dungeon— You shall soon satisfy yourself on that head, interrupted the physician. I confess that I have never been there more than three or four times, and then only to help old Tidmarsh convey to my laboratory a subject for my galvanic or anatomical experiments, and which the resurrectionists had deposited at his house in Turnmill Street. So you may believe that I know but little of the precise features of the subterranean, but we will visit it at once, and if there be a dungeon or cell there, such as you describe, we shall discover it. The physician and the earl proceeded into the bedchamber where Rainford still slept. The cell felt his pulse, examined his countenance attentively, and turned with a smile of satisfaction to the young nobleman, to whom he whispered, "'He is beyond all danger.' 
Arthur pressed the doctor's hand with fervent gratitude, while tears of happiness trembled upon his long lashes. The physician then proceeded to raise the trap-door, and, having procured a lamp from his laboratory, led the way down the spiral staircase of stone. But the huge door at the bottom was bolted on the other side, and thus further investigation was rendered impossible on that occasion. They accordingly retraced their steps to the bedroom, closed the trap-door, and spread the carpet over it again. The Earl nevertheless made up his mind to institute farther search in those mysterious premises at some future day. "'My dear young friend,' said the physician, suddenly, as they stood by the side of the bed watching the countenance of the sleeper, "'I had almost forgotten that when he awakes presently it will be necessary to administer a little stimulant, either port wine or good brandy, if such a thing can be got in this neighbourhood. "'I will hasten and procure them both immediately.' returned the earl. Give me the key of the front door that I may let myself in without troubling you to descend to open it. The cell handed the key to the nobleman, who immediately sallied forth to purchase the spirits required. Having procured a pint bottle of brandy at the most respectable tavern which he perceived in St. John Street, whither he repaired for the purpose, he was retracing his way when his eyes were suddenly attracted by a lovely female form crossing the street just mentioned and proceeding in the direction of Northampton Square. But the lady was not dressed in mourning, and therefore he conceived that he must be mistaken relative to the idea which had struck him. And yet that symmetry of form, set off rather than concealed by the ample shawl which she wore, that dignified elegance of gait, that gracefulness of carriage, were well-known characteristics of Esther de Medina. The Earl hastened after her and pronounced that name. The lady turned, raised her veil, and extended her hand to the nobleman. Yes, it was Esther, but how pale, how profoundly mournful her countenance! "'I am rejoiced to meet you,' said the Earl, in a rapid and excited tone, "'for I have news to communicate which will give you joy. "'But come with me, I implore you. "'I know all. Look upon me as a friend, and in my presence you need not blush. "'Delay not, I beseech you. Come with me at once.' "'And drawing her arm in his, he hurried her away towards Red Lion Street. "'My lord,' she said, "'I am at a loss to understand. "'Oh, you know not how nearly that which I have to communicate.' give you evidence of affects your happiness interrupted arthur but i must not tell you all in a breath it would be too much for you to hear and i am glad oh i am rejoiced that i have thus met you for i had dispatched a messenger to seek you and he might have broken the happy tidings too abruptly esther gazed upon his countenance in astonishment mingled with an expression of surprise and even alarm but the earl perceived not the strange impression that his words had produced, as he hurried her along at a rate which in a more refined neighbourhood would have attracted disagreeable attention. The house in Red Lion Street was reached, and the nobleman opened the door with extraordinary impatience. For an instant Esther hesitated to follow him, but confident of the honourable intentions of the earl, and anxious to relieve herself from the state of wonder and suspense into which his words had thrown her, she entered the gloomy-looking tenement. He led her up the dirty, decayed staircase into the laboratory, where he begged her to wait for a moment. He then softly opened the door communicating with the bedchamber, in order to acquaint Dr. Lascelles with her presence there, and in a few hurried words explain the motives which had induced him to bring her thither, for he supposed that all those circumstances which had led him to believe that the Jewess was the mistress of his half-brother were unknown to the doctor. But the moment he opened the door he started, and an ejaculation of the wildest surprise burst from his lips, for there, standing by the bed with hands clasped and eyes upraised in thankfulness to heaven, was the living counterpart of Esther de Medina. Arthur turned hastily round to convince himself that Esther had not passed in before him, but Esther was indeed a few paces behind him, alarmed by the exclamation which had burst from his lips. The truth flashed like lightning to the earl's brain. Esther de Medina had a sister, so like herself that, when apart, they might well be taken for each other. Yes, 
that must be the solution of the enigma which had bewildered him so often. "'Mr. Medina,' he said, hastily taking her hand, "'I have been labouring under a strange mistake, but you will perhaps understand how it arose when—' He led her into the room. She started back, exclaiming, "'Oh, heavens, my oath!' But in the next moment the sisters, for such indeed they were, rushed into each other's arms." End of section 56. Recording by Rod. Section 57 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds A History of the Past, Part 1 Mr. de Medina was the son of a Spanish merchant who died leaving a considerable fortune behind him, and of which this son was the sole inheritor. But by the villainy of his relations, and the corrupt decision of a Spanish judge, Mr. de Medina found himself despoiled of the riches which were rightfully his own, and at the age of two-and-twenty he quitted his native land in disgust to return to England, where indeed he had been educated, and the language of which country he spoke as fluently as his own. It is hardly necessary to state that Mr. de Medina was of the Jewish persuasion, and on his arrival in London he naturally applied to the eminent merchants of his own creed for employment. It is the fashion in this country to decry the Jews, to represent them as invariably sordid, mercenary, avaricious, and griping. Indeed, to carry the charges laid against them to such a length as to associate with their names a spirit of usury amounting to the most flagrant and dishonourable extortion. And these charges have been repeated so often, and echoed seriously by so many persons deemed a respectable authority, that the prejudice against the Jews has become interwoven with the Englishman's creed but the exceptions have been mistaken for the rule, and, strange as the assertion may sound to many ears, we boldly proclaim that there is not a more honest, intelligent, humane, and hospitable class of persons on the face of the earth than the Jews. The fact is, when an Englishman is broken down in fortune, and can no longer raise funds by mortgage on his estate, nor by the credit of his name, he flies to the money-lender, now Jews are essentially a financial nation, and money-broking in all its details is their special avocation. The class of Israelite money-lenders is therefore numerous, and it is ten to one that the broken-down individual who requires a loan addresses himself to a Jew, even if he take the money-lender living nearest to him, or to whom he is first recommended. Well, he transacts his business with this Jew, and as he can give no security beyond his bond or his bill, and his spendthrift habits are notorious, he cannot, of course, obtain the loan he seeks, save on terms proportionate to the risk incurred by the lender. Yet he goes away and curses the Jew as a usurer. And thus another voice is raised to denounce the entire nation as avaricious and griping. But does this person, however, reflect that had he applied to a Christian money-broker, the terms would have been equally high, seeing that he had no real security to offer, and that his name was already tarnished. Talk of the usury of the Jews. Look at the usury practised by Christians. Look at the rapacity of Christian attorneys. Look at the greediness of Christian bill discounters. Look, in a word, at the money-making spirit of the Christian, and then call the Jew the usurer par excellence. It is a detestable calumny, a vile prejudice, as dishonourable to the English character as it is unjust towards a generous-hearted race. We deem it right to state that these observations are recorded as disinterestedly and as impartially, as honestly and as conscientiously, as any other comments upon prejudices or abuses which have ever appeared in The Mysteries of London. Not a drop of Jewish blood flows in our veins, but we have the honour to enjoy the friendship of several estimable families of the Jewish persuasion. 
we have therefore had opportunities of judging of the Israelite character, and the reader must be well aware that the writer who wields his pen against a popular prejudice is more likely to be instigated by upright motives than he who labours to maintain it. In following the current of general opinion, one is sure to gain friends. In adventurously undertaking to stem it, he is equally certain to create enemies. But thank God this work is addressed to an intelligent and enlightened people, to the industrious classes of the United Kingdom, to those who are the true pillars of England's prosperity, glory and greatness. When Mr. de Medina arrived, friendless and almost penniless, on the British soil, he addressed himself to the heads of several eminent commercial firms in the City of London, firms the constituents of which were of his own persuasion. The Jews always assist each other to the extent of their means. Do the Christians? Answer, ye cavaliers of the persecuted race of Israel. Mr. de Medina accordingly found occupation, and so admirably did he conduct himself, so well did he promote the interests of his employers, that by the time he reached the age of thirty, he found himself a partner in the concern whose prosperity his talents and his industry had so much enhanced. He then repaired to Liverpool to establish a branch house of trade, and of which he became the sole manager. His partners dying soon afterwards, he effected an arrangement with their heirs by which he abandoned all share in the London business and retained the Liverpool house as his own. His success was now extraordinary, and his dealings were proverbially honourable and fair. He went upon the principle of doing a large business with small gains, and paying good wages to those who were in his employment. Thus, though naturally of a stern and severe disposition, his name was respected and his character admired. At the age of thirty-five, twenty years before the opening of our tale, he married a lady of his own nation, beautiful, accomplished, and rich. Within twelve months their union was blessed with a daughter, on whom the name of Tamar was bestowed, and at the expiration of another year a second girl was born, and who was called Esther. But in giving birth to the latter, Mrs. de Medina lost her life, and for a considerable time the bereaved husband was inconsolable. The kindness of his friends, and a conviction of the necessity of subduing his grief as much as possible for the sake of the motherless babes who were left to him, aroused Mr. Medina from the torpor of profound woe, and he became so passionately attached to his children that he would fondle them as if he himself were a child. As they grew up, a remarkable resemblance was observed between them, and as Esther was somewhat precocious in a physical point of view, she was as tall when ten years old as her sister. Strangers then took them for twins, although there was really twelve months' difference between their ages, but they actually appeared to be counterparts of each other. Their hair was of precisely the same intensely black and glossy shade. Their eyes were of the same dark hue and liquid luster. Their countenances presented each the same blending of the white and rich carnation, beneath the transparent tinge of delicate olive or bister which marked their origin. Their very teeth were of the same shape, and shone too between pairs of lips which nature had made in the same mould, and dyed with the same vermilion. Twin roses did the lovely sisters seem, roses on the same stock, and by the time Tamar was sixteen and Esther fifteen, the ripe beauty of the former and the somewhat precocious loveliness of the latter appeared to have attained the same glorious degree of female perfection. But their minds were not equally similar. Tamar was vain of her personal attractions, while Esther was reserved and bashful. The former was never so happy as when she was the centre of attention in a ballroom, while the latter preferred the serene tranquillity of home. In their style of dress they were equally different from each other. Tamar delighted in the richest attire, and loved to deck herself with costly jewels, and well aware that she possessed a splendid bust, she wore her gowns so low as to leave no room for conjecture relative to the charming fullness of her bosom.
Esther, on the contrary, selected good but not showy materials for her dress, and never appeared with a profusion of jewellery. Though of proportions as rich and symmetrical as her sister, yet she rather sought to conceal their swelling contours than display them. Tamar was of warm and impassioned temperament, and her breast was easily excited by fierce desires. But Esther was the embodiment of chaste and pure notions, her soul the abode of maiden innocence. Mr. de Medina often remonstrated with Tamar upon her love of splendid attire, and her anxiety to shine in the circles of gaiety. But her ways were so winning that when she threw her arms around his neck, and besought him not to be angry with her, or to allow her to accompany some female friends to a ball or concert to which she had been invited, he invariably yielded to her soft persuasion. Tamar was a few weeks past the age of sixteen, and Esther had accomplished her fifteenth year, when an incident occurred which was fated to wield a material influence over the career of the elder sister. One night, Mr. de Medina, while returning home on horseback from a neighbouring village where he had dined with a friend, was stopped and plundered of his purse and pocket-book. He was by no means a man who was likely to yield without resistance to the audacious demands of a highwayman, but he was unarmed at the time, and by some accident he was unattended by his groom. The robber, who wore a black crape over his countenance, was armed to the teeth, and seemed resolute as well as desperate. Mr. de Medina, therefore, risked not a useless contest with him, but surrendered his property as above mentioned. On his return home, and while conversing on the incident with his daughters, he suddenly recollected that the pocket-book contained a paper of great value and importance to himself, but of no use to any other person. He accordingly inserted advertisements in the local newspapers, offering a reward for the restoration of that document, and promising impunity to the robber if he would give it up. But for several days these notifications remained unanswered. A week elapsed, and one morning an individual, dressed in a semi-sporting style, called at the house and inquired for Mr. de Medina. But Mr. de Medina had just left home, for the purpose of conducting Esther to the dwelling of some friends, who resided in the neighbourhood of Liverpool, and with whom she was to pass a few days. Tamar was, however, at home, and as the servant informed her that the gentleman said his business was important, she desired that he might be shown up into the drawing-room. He was evidently struck by the dazzling beauty of the Jewess, who had thus accorded him an audience, and there was something so dashing, so rakish, so off-hand, without vulgarity, in his manner, a something between the frankness of an open-hearted man and the easy politeness of one who knows the world well, that Tamar did not treat him with that degree of cold courtesy which seems to say, have the kindness to explain your business, and then you may depart. But she requested him to be seated, and when he made a few observations, which led to a connected discourse on the gaiety and doings of the Liverpool folks, she suffered herself to be drawn into the conversation without pausing to ask the motive of his visit. Thus nearly half an hour passed away, and while Tamar thought to herself that she had never met a more agreeable gentleman in her life, and certainly never one who possessed such a brilliant set of teeth, or who looked so well in tops and cords, the stranger came to a conclusion equally favourable concerning herself. Indeed, he was quite charmed with the personal attractions and the conversation of the beautiful Jewess, and when he took his leave, she forgot that he had not communicated his business, nor even his name. When her father returned home in the afternoon, she mentioned to him the visit of the stranger, but added that he only remained a few moments, and would not explain his business to her. Mr. de Medina immediately expressed his belief that the call had some reference to his advertisement concerning the lost paper, but Tamar enthusiastically repelled the suspicion, declaring that, though he had not stayed a minute, yet his manners, appearance, and address were of too superior a nature to be associated with a dishonourable avocation. Mr. de Medina 
asked if he had intimated when he should call again, to which question Tamar, fearful that it would appear strange to give a negative reply, answered, In a few days. Thus terminated a conversation in which Tamar had been guilty of much duplicity, and which was marked by the first deliberate falsehood which she ever unblushingly told her father. On the following day the stranger returned, and Mr. de Medina, not having expected him so soon, was not at home to receive him. But Tamar was in the drawing-room to which he was conducted as on the previous day. It was summer-time, and she was engaged in tying up the drooping heads of some flowers in the large balcony. The stranger begged her not to desist from her occupation, but, on the contrary, offered in his gay manner of frank politeness to assist her. She could not refuse his aid. She did not wish to refuse it, and they were soon engaged in a very interesting conversation. He held the stalks of the flowers, too, while she tied the threads and her beautiful hand passed over that of the stranger's, not without touching it, while her breath, sweeter than the perfume of the flowers themselves, fanned his cheek. Once, when he stooped a little lower, under pretense of examining a particular rosebud more closely, his hair mingled with hers, and he could see that the rich glow of excitement flooded her countenance, her neck, and even extended to the bosom, of which he was enabled by her stooping posture to catch more than partial glimpses. When next their eyes met, there seemed to be already a tacit kind of intelligence established between them, an intelligence which appeared to say she knew he had allowed his hair to mingle with hers on purpose, and that she had not withdrawn her head because the contact pleased her. The interesting conversation was continued, and an hour had passed before either the stranger showed the slightest sign of an intention to take his leave, or Tamar remembered how long they had been alone together. When he did at length take up his hat and his riding whip, he also picked up a flower which Tamar had accidentally broken off from its stem in the balcony, and placing it in his buttonhole, without making the slightest allusion to the little incident, he bowed and quitted the room. He had been gone at least ten minutes ere Tamar again recollected that he had not 